Father, thank you for bringing me back today and all those in this room with me, Father, that we could share in the joy of the fellowship of saints and the chance to pray for one another, Father, the privileges that come with our entrance into the body of Christ by faith, by the blood of Christ. And Father, for the study tonight, as I have prepared, Father, you know I have sought to do as according to your will, and yet, Father, I fall short as all men do. So I pray that the words I speak would come not from me, but from you that the Holy Spirit would teach us all here tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Exodus chapter 2. Well, the nation of Israel is held in bondage in Egypt, and God is growing them into a people who will inherit the land that God promised to them. Remember from last week, He placed them in Egypt to keep them from intermarrying with the Canaanites, which was beginning to happen according to Genesis chapter 38. And He wanted to incubate the nation to the point where they might be sufficiently capable of entering into the land and holding that land, the land that God had promised to Abraham. And so he had a plan. The plan was to put them in Egypt for a time. And while they're in Egypt, they could grow free from the chance of intermarriage with the Canaanites, with the cursed Canaanites. And then he went a step further and he put them in slavery so that they could not intermingle with the Egyptians either. It's a fascinating plan. Now, meanwhile... The pharaohs of the 18th dynasty are intent on destroying the Semites who are in their land and Israel, of course, among them. Their hatred of the Jewish people stems from, in part, Egypt's recent history, where prior to the 18th dynasty, from the 13th to the 17th dynasties, you had Semitic rulers over Egypt. Semites who had come from outside Egypt, conquered the Egyptians and ruled for hundreds of years. That history we went through last week prompted the Egyptians to become the first anti-Semitic nation that we know of in history. And at the changing of the guard, when the 18th dynasty stood up and the pharaoh Ahmos became the pharaoh for Egypt, he was a true Hamite, a true Egyptian. He took it upon himself to destroy and run out all Semites who might be in the land. And those that stayed behind, he enslaved. And that's what happened to the nation of Israel. Meanwhile, the nation continues to grow. Israel is strengthened by God's word, by the fact that God has promised that they would grow, and they are becoming a mighty nation. It's as if a nation is growing up inside another nation. And this has tremendous concern for the pharaohs because they know the history of Semites ruling over them, and the last thing they care to see is another nation of Semites rise up in power within the borders of Egypt and threaten the pharaohs. So, The first pharaoh that comes to the 18th dynasty, Achmose, A-H-M-O-S-E, and he would be the first name at the top of that family tree in that handout. He rises to power trying to destroy the nation of Israel. We read that last week in chapter 1. It failed. Later, his son, Amenhotep I, he tried to pick up where dad failed, and he tried to weaken the nation by increasing the harshness of their labor and... God supernaturally preserved the nation during this time and they continued to grow and frustrate the pharaohs to no end. At the end of chapter 1, we hear of Amenhotep's attempt to kill all male children. He was trying to have the midwives kill the babies, the male children, as they come out of the womb. And he was trying to do it in a way that the mothers wouldn't know this was actually taking place. But the women, the midwives, failed to cooperate, so the plan fails And so Amenhotep I decides to take an even bolder step in the same direction. And that's where we left off. Chapter 1, verse 22. The very last verse is really where we start tonight because it sets up chapter 2. And at the very end of chapter 1, we hear of Amenhotep I now taking a new step, a new step of action against the Jews. Verse 22. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born... You are to cast into the Nile, and every daughter you are to keep alive. When Amenhotep's plan to kill the children fails, he decrees that all the Egyptians themselves now are commissioned to kill Hebrew male children. If they see a Hebrew child, male child, infant, they can cast it into the Nile, drowning it, in other words. Now, why would the people of Egypt be willing to participate in a plan like that? As bad as they may be, you're talking about a whole culture being willing to practice infanticide. Well, the Nile River itself was considered a god to the Egyptians. Practically everything was a god to the Egyptians. The Nile was one of their chief gods. And it's likely that the Pharaoh simply declared that the god wanted a sacrifice and that the people were required to 
meet the God's demands and that the God wanted a sacrifice of the Hebrew male children that may have made it easier for them to go along with the plan. In any case, that's what Pharaoh asked be done. And we're not sure to what degree it was actually carried out. Uh, We don't know how many Hebrew boys were killed in this way, but we can conclude that it had little effect overall because the population growth of Israel continues unabated. So it wasn't any more successful in its end than the earlier ones were. And we can attribute that to the same cause. God protecting the nation of Israel because he said he would. When Israel finally leaves Egypt, they're going to be several million strong, which is itself a miracle considering the fact that they were in harsh labor. And they reach this number only after a few generations. So it's really very remarkable. God blessing this nation in a great way. So now the end of chapter one leads us directly into the story of Moses. And if you may remember from last week, I said we are still in part one of the six parts that you can divide up the book of Exodus into. And part one is the call of Moses. So we're still at that early stage of trying to know who is Moses and how did he reach the point of being the man God was going to use. Let's go to chapter two, reading one through four now. and We move more into the story of Moses. Now, a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a wicker basket and covered it over with tar and pitch. Then she put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him. If you're like me, whenever you're reading this story, images flash into your mind from Charlton Heston, right? It's like that's our view of what this is all like. And I understand that. In fact, I've made this point before and I've taught other books that had Uh, history of cinema and if you have seen the movies okay that's fine do your best to forget it not to say that it was all wrong I don't know how much of it was right or wrong I can barely remember it but because it's one person's view of something it's not the Holy Spirit and you have the Holy Spirit in you he will teach you the true understanding he wants you to have and where it where it lines up with the movie so be it but where it doesn't just as well if you haven't seen the movie don't go see it wait at least until you're done with the study Because you want to have a fresh understanding. You want to let God impress upon you what really is happening here. So the story of Moses begins with a mention of his parents. They're not named here. We're going to later get the names of these two in Exodus chapter 6. They're not named because they're not that important. And that's, I think, in keeping here with why the author, Moses himself, declined to name his own parents at this point. Because it's not that important to him. His importance in this story is not his pedigree. In fact, it's to the opposite. He was a weak man in many respects. God used him despite his weakness. So that's part of the storyline, and Moses is showing us that even here. Both his parents are of the tribe of Levi. What's really interesting is Moses' father married his own aunt, the man's aunt, which was permitted in that day, but in the law that God gives through Moses, it becomes outlawed. So Moses had to write the law that said that his own parents couldn't marry if they were to have done it after that point. So interesting. In verse 2, the mother gives birth, we're told, to a son. Immediately she notices something unique about the boy. Now, the text says in English that he was beautiful. The word in Hebrew is tov. It has a wide variety of meanings. It usually means good or beautiful or favorable in some context. But it can also mean worthy or pleasing, as in pleasing in the sight of the Lord. Now, we know, I think we can all logically conclude, every mother thinks their child is beautiful. So you can't read this with the interpretation that she had this baby and thought, oh, this is this is a keeper. (laughs) You know, I wasn't sure. But now that I'm looking at him, yeah, we're going to definitely hold on to this. No, that's silly. Every mom wants to hold on to their child. That can't be what this text is saying. In fact, you could even argue many Jewish women probably tried to hide their children. I mean, why would she be the only one? The meaning here is fundamentally different. It's in this sense that he was special special in a way that God impressed upon her that he had a future that made him different than any other child. Hebrews actually confirms this for us, the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 11.23 says this, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. The, The writer says, by faith, Moses. But actually, the object of the verb is not Moses, it's the parents. The parents had a faith that they needed to hide this child, not fearing what would happen to them for doing so. That's the faith they had in God's revelation, whatever that may be. Josephus wrote that Moses' father had been given a revelation from God that Moses 
would one day humble the Egyptians. Now, we don't know if what Josephus wrote is right or not. We can't say for sure. It's not scripture. But it may be a confirmation. Hebrews, though, tells us without any doubt that there's an act of faith involved in this moment, something that was being revealed and acted upon by these parents. After three months, she can't hide them any longer. And, you know, infants get to a point where they're noisier and they're more active, and that's going to be impossible. Sooner or later, someone's going to see them. When the baby's found, he will be killed or somebody may try to. So the mom now has to make this desperate decision of how to save her child. She knew she had to let the child go in order to save its life. So she puts him in a basket. Your Bible may say an ark. She waterproofs it with pitch. And then after placing the child in the basket, she sets it afloat on the Nile. It's ironic that Moses' mother saves her child by placing him in the Nile since the Pharaoh's command was that a male child be put in the Nile. He didn't say he couldn't put him in a boat. We don't know what she expected to see happen to this child. She probably didn't know what she expected to see happen to this child. She probably hoped that somebody would pick the child up and make it his own. Some Egyptian would do that. She didn't know who would do that, of course. And I have to imagine it was a terribly painful decision that someone else could raise her child and that not be her, but it's better than seeing the child die. Moses' sister, who we later find out is called Miriam, her name is Miriam, stands at a distance to watch what will happen to her baby brother. It's a very poignant moment. Perhaps the mother couldn't bear to watch herself, and so she asks for the daughter to do it and then report back. Now, even at this early point in the story, there are some important themes beginning to emerge. And if you remember from last week, I said Exodus is just rich in all these pictures. All these themes are going to come up over and over again. The first I want to point out is the theme of God's sovereignty. And it's going to be the most recurring one. It's the most powerful one in the story. We've already reflected, I think, even last week on God's sovereignty evident in the way that Israel entered into Egypt through Joseph and his family situation, how they had to go into slavery to be protected from intermarriage. All of that is God's sovereignty. I think of people in this plan as simply pawns on a chessboard where God lovingly is controlling the lives of people to ensure certain outcomes, but the pieces themselves aren't always aware of that. In fact, we're usually not aware of that. That doesn't lessen God's ability to move us, though. Sovereignty is throughout this story. God was working from the days of Noah when he cursed Canaan, and the nation of Canaan. He was working through the Abrahamic covenant when he assigned a place for Israel in Canaan. He was working when he sent Joseph to Egypt. He was working when he put him in slavery. And now we see God beginning to work how he's going to deliver them. And the first step is to prepare the deliverer, the one who will be used in that way. God intends to raise up a man of prominence and stature and power and ability among the Hebrews, one who will ultimately humble the Egyptians, as Josephus wrote. But the curious question for the reader, if we don't know the the full story yet, if we're coming into this for the first time, we would be asking, how is he going to do this when Israel's in slavery? How do you raise up a deliverer from within slavery? At the first hint of somebody trying to rise up into power, the Egyptians would just stamp that down. How is he going to get to the point of prominence? Well, the answer comes in the form of the edict because the decree was that all males would die that decree forces Moses' mother to give him up to becoming an Egyptian, which she never would have done otherwise. In that way, God ensures Moses enjoys the best of Egypt, the training, the knowledge, the cultivation of his character and his, his skills and various arts. And then when the time is right, God can put all of that to work according to his purposes. This, this upbringing uniquely prepares him to serve in the role God is going to give him. He knows the Egyptian language. He knows the Egyptian culture. He's known by the Egyptian court. And so his ability to rise up into this role is ushered in because of decree here. We're going to see more later. But closely connected to this first theme is a second major theme, which I really love to point out. And we will also see throughout this book the theme of Moses as a picture of Christ. Moses is a strong picture of Christ in this story. For example, Jesus is a deliverer who will lead Israel out of slavery to their sin. And Moses is a lesser form of that same kind of deliverer, leading them out of a physical slavery or a physical bondage. The story of Moses begins in almost the same way as the story of Jesus. Like Moses, Jesus is born of humble circumstances to godly parents. Like Moses, Jesus was saved from a ruler who was intent on destroying male children when they were very young. 
You may remember when Jesus was an infant, King Herod heard the prophecy that a Messiah had been born to Israel. He was worried that the king might displace him on the throne of Israel. So he asked the Magi, tell me where he is so I can come worship him. Ha, right? Magi knew that was a trick. So they turned tables on Herod and left town in the other direction and never came back to see Herod again. That made Herod mad. So then he sends out the forces to kill all male children living in and around Bethlehem. God warns Joseph before that happens. And through an angel, they're told to go to Egypt of all places. Later, Matthew refers to this connection in his gospel when he writes in Matthew 2.14. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. But what he just quoted from, what Matthew just quoted from is Hosea 11 and in that context, when we go back to Hosea 11 and we read that in context, this is what he says, Hosea 11, 1. When Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. So in Hosea, Israel is the son being referred to literally. Matthew applies it as a picture when he says this is to fulfill that picture, Jesus coming out of Egypt to fulfill the picture that Moses set up for us in the first place, which was Moses leading Israel coming out of Egypt. We're seeing firsthand in Scripture that it was always in God's plan that Moses would be seen as a picture of Christ. And to make that picture even clearer for us, he gave Jesus time to be in Egypt to escape a ruler who wanted to kill him. All the picture pieces sort of falling into place. Matthew makes a broader application of that prophecy to create that connection or that shadow. So when you hear the term shadow in Scripture, a shadow, it means in the same way that a shadow works in real life, I guess. When you look at my shadow, if you know me, then when you look at the shadow, you can recognize it usually. You know, that looks like Steve. I can see it. But it's not Steve. It's not me. I'm here. My shadow's there. It's not me, but it looks like me, and it reminds you of me, and it's similar to me, faintly. Well, that's what pictures are in Scripture. They're faint representations of something that will come later in reality. And Moses is that faint representation of the Messiah to come. Interesting. A lot more pictures of Christ in Moses' life. We'll see that throughout the story. Exodus 2, verse 5. We'll pick up now with the rest of the story. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the Nile with her maidens walking alongside the Nile. And she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid, and she brought it to her. When she opened it, she saw the child. And behold, the boy was crying. And she had pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go ahead. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. The child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moses and said, Because I drew him out of the water. Well, since it's God's plan to see Moses set afloat in the Nile so that he could be raised an Egyptian, well, naturally, he's prepared the perfect person to save the child out of the water, which is Pharaoh's daughter. The daughter of Pharaoh was bathing, we're told, in the Nile, which is a common practice. Women often bathed in the river. The daughter is very important, this Pharaoh's daughter. It's a woman called Hatshepsut. Her father is Tutmos I. Hatshepsut becomes key player in the next phase of the story of Exodus. And understanding Hatshepsut's role in Egypt and in the story of Moses is really important. And it's worth a few minutes of Egyptian history now and some later for you to understand why. As I said, her father's Tutmosis the first. At the time she finds Moses, her father has just inherited the throne. He's in the first year of his rule after the death of Amenhotep the first. Later, Tutmosis the first takes a second wife and from the second wife, he will sire a male heir. And we'll come back to that later, but I just wanted to set that up for you. Moving on, Moses' sister, Miriam, she observes Hatshepsut claiming Moses from the river. And this brave girl has the presence of mind to approach Pharaoh's daughter, offering to find her a Hebrew woman capable of nursing this baby. Clearly, Pharaoh's daughter is not going to have the ability to feed the baby herself, so it makes sense. It's a wonderful opportunity. Thank you. I'll take that offer. Go find me somebody. And, of course, Miriam knows the perfect woman to nurse this child, right? Her mom. So she brings the baby's own mother, 
Hatshepsut hires Moses' mother to nurse and care for the child. So not only does she keep possession of the child, at least for a time, she gets paid for it. I mean, remember that next time you wonder if God's capable of meeting all our needs or taking care of all of our problems. In fact, in that day, babies were nursed for the first five years. In fact, weaning was officially done on the fifth birthday. That's what happened to Isaac, if you remember. He was weaned on his fifth birthday. So Moses' mother has the benefit of raising Moses in her own home for five years. During those years, she would have had the ability to impress upon Moses his Jewish roots. And that's a foundation that will become very important to him later in life. And that's where he gets his Jewishness. His sense of Jewishness comes out of those first five years of growing up in that home. In verse 10, we're told how his name, Moses' name, comes from Pharaoh's daughter. His name in Hebrew is Moshe, which is actually an Egyptian word. It's not a Hebrew word. It's a word in Egyptian that the Hebrews have brought into their language because it's Moses' proper name in Egypt. Members of an Egyptian dynasty, of whatever dynasty you're talking about, so in this case it's the 18th dynasty, they all had a family name for those members of that dynasty. So the name of any given member of the family would be a combination of their family name and then a prefix in front of that family name, which was usually an Egyptian god. So they'd take the name of an Egyptian god, put it in front of their name, and then have the back end of their name be their family name, their dynasty name. I want you to notice the dynasty name of the 18th dynasty. In English, it's M-O-S-E. So you had Akmos, now you have Tutmos. And so Moses, or Moses as we say, is the dynasty name and Moses is taking on the dynasty name of the Egyptians in the dynasty he was born into. We should then also assume that he had a longer name. And in front of Moshe or Mos was his god name, some god of Egypt that was placed in front of his name. We don't know what it is, but we can probably guess that because of what the Pharaoh's daughter says, that he was given the Nile River God name as the first part of his name because she says, I drew him out of the Nile. A little twist on history here. The word Moshe in Hebrew has become a pun. It is similar to another Hebrew word, Masha, M-A-S-H-A-H, which means to draw water like out of a well. So it's a pun in the sense that it's, it sounds similar to another word in Hebrew that means to draw from water, but that's not what the... Pharaoh's daughter would have been thinking clearly. She didn't know any Hebrew. It wasn't of any interest to her what it meant in Hebrew. She was using her family name and she would put probably that Nile God name in front of it. Now, the story of Moses from this verse where I stopped jumps forward from this time in his life, this early time of five years old, to 35 years later when Moses is right about the age 40. Verse 11 picks up when he's at that age. Now it came about in those days when Moses had grown up that he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he took this, he looked this way and that, and when he saw that no one was around, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So in verse 11, we're told Moses went out to his brethren, which means, of course, to the place where the Hebrew slaves were encamped and working. He's there, it says, to observe or take notice, you might say, of their hard labors. Now, while he's there, as the story goes, he notices an Egyptian taskmaster beating one of the Hebrews. And at this point, Moses decides to act in defense of that Hebrew. First, he makes sure no Egyptian is watching. And then when the coast is clear, Moses kills the Egyptian taskmaster and buries him in the sand. Now, this scene raises a lot more questions than it answers. And by the way, this is one of those scenes where if you saw the movie you really don't have a good understanding of what was going on because the movie doesn't really get this right. I mean, they get the action right, guy killed and all of that, but they don't get the the intonation of why. So you're left not clear on why Moses decided to do this because Moses could have visited the Hebrew slaves any day in the first 40 years of his life. I mean, he could have done this at any point. It's not like he was surprised when he showed up and he realized, oh, they're working my people hard. He knew this from the very beginning. There's nothing surprising about that. There's nothing particularly surprising about an Egyptian taskmaster beating a Hebrew slave. They've been doing that for 40 years, more than 40 years. So why does Moses take this action and do it at this moment? That's the fundamental question that's really driving the narrative. Why now? Why here? Why Moses? Well, there's two places in the New Testament that tell us the reason why. First, you go to Hebrews again, chapter 11, verse 24 we pick up there. And we're told this. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, 
choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasure of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. So Moses, we're told in Hebrews, reached a point when by faith he repudiated his identity as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And that decision carried significant implications for him, of course, in the culture. It meant setting aside a life of power, a life of comfort in the Pharaoh's realm, in the Pharaoh's house. He no longer had access to the wealth of Pharaoh in in Egypt. All that fine living that came with it was gone at the moment he does this. It probably was the moment when Moses dropped that first part of his name. That would have been the clearest way he could have communicated, I will not be called Pharaoh's daughter. So instead of being blank Mose, whatever it was, he cut that out. He says, I'm not following a Nile God, I'm following the God of the Hebrews. And he became simply Mose or Moses, as we say. In this way, he chose to become associated with the Hebrew people and not with the Egyptian people. And as the writer says, he would then endure ill treatment because of his new identity. Notice the language the writer uses here, though, when he compares the two lives. He says, living in the way of the Egyptian society was what? Enjoying the passing pleasure of sin. And enduring the suffering of the Hebrews was compared with sharing in the reproach of Christ. So you have, on the one hand, living as the world lives. In his day, the world was Egypt. Meant the passing pleasures of sin. Taking on the identity of God's people and taking all the suffering that came with it was sharing in the reproach of Christ. Does that not echo New Testament letters to the believer in the church? I summed up at least half of Paul's letters. Taking on the shame of Christ, putting on Christ, and identifying with the people of God is the upward call that we all share in Christ. And it must come at the expense of finding our identity in the world. I love this because it just echoes so much of what the New Testament teaches. You can either have money or God. You cannot have two masters. You know, the world is embodied in that statement, the love of the world. You can't put one foot in both worlds. If that's the theological teaching of Scripture, then what it must mean, practically speaking, is that if you feel like you've actually attained that balance, then you're living entirely in the world and you're ignorant of the fact that you are. Because you can't be in both. So if you think you've straddled it successfully, what you've really done is assuaged your sense of guilt or conviction about it and you've found a way to be comfortable in the world. That's the only way I can conclude. Because if you're not living in the world, you're going to know it. You're going to suffer the reproach of Christ one way or another. So why did Moses take this step? Still looking for that answer. Why did Moses take that step? Hebrews says Moses' decision was a matter of faith. In that, Moses recognized that the eternal reward for God's people was a much greater prize than anything Egypt could offer him in the near term. What led him to that understanding? What led him to that faith and that understanding? Why did he wait nearly 40 years to make that commitment, to make that decision? Well, these events are being triggered by something that's going on politically in Egypt. So once again, we need to learn a little bit of the history of Egyptian politics if we're going to understand everything that's happening at this point in Moses' life. And for this section, it's going to be helpful if you use the handout that I've given you that shows the family tree for the pharaohs. Tutmose I begins to rule in about 1525 B.C. But interestingly, Tutmose I is not the son of Amenhotep I. Amenhotep actually dies childless. But his sister married, and her husband becomes the next pharaoh. So the next pharaoh, Tutmose I, is the brother-in-law of Amenhotep I. Now, Tutmose I has a daughter by his first wife, a woman called Hatshepsut. And to gain a male heir, Tutmos I eventually takes a second wife, and through the second wife, he has a son who becomes the pharaoh Tutmos II. So Tutmos I has a daughter by one wife, a woman named Hatshepsut, and he has a son by a second wife, the pharaoh Tutmos II. Now, when Tutmos I died, Tutmos II became pharaoh, and eventually... As he becomes Pharaoh, he sires a male heir through his wife, and that son is going to be Tutmose the third. But Tutmose the second dies unexpectedly in 1504 BC, and his son, Tutmose the third, is too young to rule the throne at that point. He's only a small child. And so his aunt, 
who is Hapshetset, the daughter of Tutmos II, she seizes the opportunity to take control of the throne of Egypt and co-rule with her nephew, Tutmos III. But in reality, Hapshetset is the pharaoh of Egypt. She was an unusually strong woman in this very male-dominated culture. She went by the title Queen. And we know from archaeology, from things that have been discovered, the drawings and monuments to her and so on in Egypt, that she adopted certain male mannerisms to minimize objection to her rule. She even began wearing a fake beard of the style that you see, one that was strapped on, basically, so that in the way that she was seen in the culture, it was more acceptable that she would be ruling. She reigned Egypt until her death in 1485 B.C. So long as she was alive, Tutmos remained in the shadows and he was unable to consolidate power to himself. She controlled all the power centers of Egypt. She ensured that the ruling class and the military remained loyal to her. So for the first half of his adult life, Tutmos was little more than a puppet pharaoh. And all the while, he deeply resented her domination of the throne. But he couldn't do anything about it as long as she was alive. She died in 1485 B.C. After her death, Tutmos goes on a vendetta to erase her memory if it were possible. All official references of her are removed from the history of Egypt. Her face is carved off of every stone monument. Her name is removed from any building or any official record. I mean, this guy was, had a one-track purpose, and that was to eliminate any record that he ever didn't rule in his lifetime. Obviously, Moses was closely associated with Hepsetchet. She was his adopted mother. So he was especially vulnerable in this time. It would only be a matter of time before Tutmos took some action against him. He was just waiting for some opportunity, some ruse that he could use to, to make that happen. And it probably wasn't going to last very long. So realizing that he had nothing left to hold him to the Egyptian way of life, Moses is stirred to reconnect to the Hebrew people that he, that he knows he's come from and to act upon his faith which God has given him. And by the way, the year of Hatshepsut's death, Moses' 40th year. Moses' faith led him to choose God's people over Egypt, but it was his circumstances, the circumstances of his mother's death and Tutmos' threats that prompted the timing of his action. Every walk of obedience that I know of works like this. People of faith. Everyone walks in obedience in something like this manner. You have both faith tugging on your heart and the Lord pushing you from behind through circumstance. Almost inevitably. Moses has been given this thought, this inclination to visit his fellow Hebrews, probably on numerous occasions in the past. He may have even witnessed similar moments in their history. I mean, it's hard to believe in all the time he spent in Egypt, he never had anything to do or see about the Hebrews. It's almost inevitable that he saw it. As a young child, he would have seen it when he was with his mother. But because God eliminated every other option Moses had in the culture, then he was able to clearly see that his only future lie with the people of Israel, with the Hebrews. And then he took that step of faith. That's not a sign of weakness per se. I think it's a sign of our humanity. But I think it's a greater sign of God's grace. That he knows we need a push once in a while and he's willing to give it. And he's willing to do it in such a way that we don't have an option. And I have to tell you, some of the biggest steps of faith I've ever made are the ones where it was the only thing I could do. <laughs> you move because you lose your job or you, you have to do something financially because you have no other option. I mean, then you realize, well, I should have done that a long time ago. But no, you shouldn't. That was when you were supposed to do it. But God needed to bring those circumstances to bear. With each of those, though, your faith is built. And the next time, he doesn't have to push it quite as hard. So after taking this step, a curious thing happens. Exodus 2.13. A curious thing happens. He went out the next day, and behold, two Hebrews were fighting with each other. And he said to the offender, Why are you striking your companion? And he said to him, Who made you a prince or a judge over us? Are you intending to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and said, Surely the matter has become known. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Well, Moses returns the next day to the Hebrew encampment. And this is really interesting. Why is he going back? You know, the old adage, they always return to the scene of the crime. I don't buy that. There's no reason for him to go back in fact, there's every reason for him not to go back in light of what he just did. It's a risk to him to go back. Why is he going back? And then you have this really interesting encounter where he, 
he sees these two Hebrew slaves fighting with one another and he steps in to stop the fight, asking one of them, why are you, know, why are you fighting with each other? The one looks at him and says, well, who made you prince or judge, right? Where are you getting off telling us what we can do? And then that same person asks and says, well, are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? Now he's stunned by this comment. You can tell by his response that he didn't expect to hear that. These two Hebrews, the ones that are fighting right here, they were not involved in the prior day's events. They were not present, remember? He looked around to see if anyone was looking. No one was looking. The only witness to the event was the Hebrew that was getting beaten. The next day, though, the news of that event is spread so far and so fast that these two other Hebrew youths are aware of it and they know the story and they know to point out to Moses, you're the guy who did it. That leads Moses to come to the obvious conclusion. This matter has become known. And what he means is everyone knows. The word's out. He realizes that the Hebrews are the ones spreading the story. His own people are telling on him. And if the Hebrews are speaking this openly about it, it's only going to be a matter of time before Pharaoh finds out himself. And of course, Pharaoh does. And knowing that Tutmos is looking for any reason that he could to kill Moses, this is more than enough. In their culture, anyone of the royal court could kill anyone they wanted to with impunity as part of the way Egyptian culture operated. So under normal circumstances, he'd have had no reason to be worried about the fact that he stepped in and killed a taskmaster, except the vulnerability he has because of his mother's death. So what's disturbing to Moses here, even more than their loose lips, was the fact that the Hebrews here are clearly unwilling to be ruled by him. That's the real concern in this moment. The youths say, well, who made you prince or judge? Clearly, they're not interested in seeing Moses lead over them. And they even mock him a little for his presumptuousness in attempting to judge between them in this moment. The question you have to ask yourself is, is that what Moses was trying to do? Was Moses actually seeking to lead the Hebrews here when he killed the Egyptian? Well, let's consider what Stephen says in the book of Acts when he recounts this history in his monologue in Acts chapter 7. He says this in 722. Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power in word and in deed. But when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered into his mind to visit his brethren, the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defended him and took vengeance for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. And he supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him, but they did not understand. So when Stephen recounts the history of Exodus, chapter 2 specifically, he says Moses was a man of power and word. He approached his 40th birthday. And then at this point in his life, it entered into his mind to come visit his brethren. Stephen doesn't tell us here why it entered his mind, but we already understand why it entered his mind. God was putting it in his mind. God was preparing him for this role. God was working through faith in Moses' heart and the circumstances of his mother's death to prompt this visit. Then he relates the story of the killing. But you notice the perspective he gives on the actions from that moment? First of all, he doesn't say Moses murdered the Egyptian. He says Moses came to the aid of a fellow Hebrew. This is a type of justifiable homicide. This is self-defense for the sake of another. It makes clear to us that we're not looking at a murder here. We're looking at an act of self-defense. And then in verse 25, we get to the most important part of Stephen's testimony and the part that, that we're really leading up to here in our question of why did Moses take this action. It says Moses supposed, in verse 25, that the Hebrew people would understand and recognize that he was acting in this way because he had been called to be their deliverer. What we're being told by Stephen is God had told Moses, you will be their deliverer. Moses knew that even at this early moment and was acting out in faith according to that promise. That's the faith that Hebrews 11 was referring to when it talked about Moses' willingness to turn aside from being an Egyptian and to become a Hebrew. You know, James would tell us that faith without works is dead, that there needs to be a works component for God to get the value out of the faith that he's given. Otherwise, James says, it's worthless. And here's the value. God wanted Moses to act on his identity to become a deliverer for the nation of Israel. But then Stephen says the Hebrews didn't understand this. They didn't recognize this is what God was calling. They didn't recognize Moses in this way and rally behind him. That's why Moses returns the next day thinking he is their leader. He thinks they'll be embraced because God's called me. Clearly, if he's called me, when I show up, I should expect the people to embrace me. Isn't that how it works? But what if they mock him? What if they reject him? Well, he wasn't looking for that. He wasn't ready for that. And he's surprised by that. 
And if the Hebrew people won't support me, Moses must have thought, well, I have only one choice left then. I can't be an Egyptian anymore. I burned that bridge. And my own people don't want me. I have to leave. And so he flees the land. Moses had the right idea, wrong timing. Right idea, wrong timing. He was on the right track, but he didn't understand God's entire program. And what he didn't understand specifically was it was another 40 years in the waiting before he would actually act as the deliverer that he was promised to be. Understanding that history, by the way, is really helpful to explaining Moses' hesitation to take the reins of authority 40 years later when God appears to him in the bush and says, it's time you go be that deliverer. And he's got a thousand excuses for why it can't be him. One of them is they won't listen to me. Now you understand a little of why he was saying that. He tried it once. It didn't work. He remembered that Israel did not want to follow him the first time. And I think what he must have done after that was dismiss from his mind the whole idea that he was going to lead them from the land. The next time you feel discouraged in your own pursuit of ministry in whatever form, I mean, we all have ministry. There's no such thing as a Christian without a call to ministry. It just takes different forms. But when you have something discouraging in your own pursuit, remember, God may have laid something on your heart and you feel that burden and you recognize that call, but it's not working It just may be your timing. There may be some preparation that has to happen. There may be some seasoning God needs to do in your life before he's ready to use you. He will often, if Scripture's any guide, he will often reveal your purpose before he reveals your mission. And you may have to spend some time working between those two pieces to get ready for it. If you act too early, and I often do, and God therefore doesn't bring the result we expect because we're early, because our timing isn't right, just remember the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable according to Scripture. So sooner or later, your timing is going to be right. So keep trying or keep listening and then try when you're told to try. But what you don't want to do, and I think what Moses does a little bit when he's called again in the desert, is to use your past disappointment as reason to say no to God when he finally gives you the green light to go into whatever he's called you to do. If you do that, you end up making the same mistake twice. Your timing's wrong again, in the opposite way. You'll have missed God's timing a second time. There's another great picture of Christ here. Did you see it in the story of Moses? Jesus lived a normal life by all accounts, so normal that we don't have a record of it past about the age of 12. When he reached his 30th year, he received a call from God. And I'm not saying he was like Moses in the sense that he didn't know it was coming. What I'm saying is there was a point in life when he was called to begin his public ministry. And what was the call? The call was to go out and become the leader of the Jewish people. To be their Messiah specifically, but to be their leader. And like Moses, the Jews did not recognize Jesus as their appointed leader. And so they rejected him, which required that Jesus go away for a while. To come back in a future day. In the meantime, Israel is left in their bondage. In their bondage to sin. Just as they were left in their bondage in Egypt. Then in verse 15, Moses makes his escape and finally stops traveling when he reaches Midian. Now, there was a map in the room. We'll hand this out as we go just to help you have a reference. This is something else we will come back to later. When we cover the crossing of the Red Sea, there is a widely held misconception of where the Jews camped and received the law. The conventional wisdom, it's in the Sinai Peninsula. As we'll see when we get to this part of the study later, they're wrong. That's not where it took place. And you'll begin to see that's proof right now in the map you have in front of you. Because the same place they camp for the law is the place where he starts his new life in Midian. Mount Horeb is in Midian, according to Exodus. And Midian, as you look on your map, is not in the Sinai Peninsula. It's in current day Saudi Arabia. What we'll do when we get to that part of the teaching, after we've covered it in Scripture, we're going to have one night or at least part of a night where we will play a video for you of some researchers who traveled in some very interesting ways to get into Saudi Arabia because this area is fenced off and protected. The Saudis won't let anyone go near it. And they'll show you video of the mountain where Moses received the law. And it looks just like you'd expect it to after all that we read about in Exodus. And you go to the site that's popularly referred to as the Mount Sinai location, and none of the features match the Bible's rendition. So Saudi Arabia knows they have the mountain of Moses, and they don't want the world to know it. But some people have got video of it, and you'll see it in here. We'll do that when we get there. But Midian, as you notice, is this location well east of the popular location of where the mountain is. And it's the place where Moses goes and the home he makes 
in the years that he stays outside of Egypt. If you notice the last thing I read in verse 15, Moses reaches Midian. Where does he stop? He stops at a well. Now, if you've studied Genesis with me, then you know any time a traveler stops at a well, good things are about to happen. (laughs) Sooner or later, you get married if you stay at a well long enough. And sure enough, Exodus 2.16. Now, the priests of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. When they came to Roel, their father, he said, Why have you come back so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. And what is more, he even drew the water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, where is he then? Why is it that you have left the man behind? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses was willing to dwell with the man. And he gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses. Then she gave birth to a son and named him Gershom. For he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. So Moses is in Midian. That's the northwestern corner of Saudi Arabia. It's just south of Jordan. While there, he encounters seven daughters. They came together to draw water for their father's flock, as we're told. And uh, in the course of doing that, a band of hooligans, some kind of rogue shepherds, I don't know, they run the women off. And uh, Moses decides to intervene, being the chivalrous type that he is. I mean, after all, it's Charlton Heston. That guy was always doing good things. Uh, He comes to the aid of the women. And then he draws water for them, and the women run back to tell their dad. And probably out of a combination of surprise and happiness that there's a strange man in the neighborhood. And uh, I mean, I I don't know what their culture was like, but I doubt they had these guys just walking in every day. So this is important. Probably each one was trying to be the first back to dad to tell him, I found somebody. Now, we know Moses was not a Hamite. That is, he was not a native Egyptian. He was a Semite. And yet they call him an Egyptian. You notice in verse 19, what that means is he was dressed and probably made up like an Egyptian. He probably had his head shaved like Joseph would have when his brothers encountered him. He may have had the the eye makeup or whatever they used to do, the long beard perhaps. Certainly would have been dressed in their garb. So he looks like an Egyptian. And in their excitement, the women leave him behind and run to tell dad. And then dad, his name is Ruel. And uh, he says, where is this guy? Bring him back. By the way, in chapter 3... He starts being called Jethro. Some people wonder, well, why, why is the name change? Well, Jethro is not a name. It's a title. It's like Pharaoh. So his priestly title is Jethro. His name is Ruel. One thing leads to another, and uh, next thing you know, Moses is hitched. He has a wife, and he has a son, Gershom, and the name means literally driven out. So it's a reference to his being driven out of Egypt. And for the next 40 years, he's going to serve Jethro. Remember, Jethro is a priest of Midian and priest of the high God, similar in some respects to the way Melchizedek was the priest of his day. Not that they are of the same order necessarily, but they both form a role of priest. If he is a priest in that land, then his son-in-law, Moses, may have very well been considered a priest as well, at least by the Midianites, because priesthood was typically a family thing as well. So just like kings passed on their throne, priests passed on their role as well. If that's true, and knowing he was also a shepherd during that time, then we may have another picture of Christ here. Although I'm not saying it's intended by Scripture, it may be a bit forced. But remember, after Jesus was resurrected, in the time when he's away from the nation of Israel, what role does he play? He is the high priest for the Gentiles that are being called under him, and he is our shepherd. So in the same way that Moses was potentially a priest and shepherd to a non-Jewish people, Maybe there's a picture there as well of Jesus in his role now. That may be a stretch, but I found it interesting anyway. So we'll stop there for the night. We'll come back next week and go through the rest of two, certainly, and well into three, and uh, pick up the story from there. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for all the teaching that we receive through the Holy Spirit, for the insight that is ours by his work. But, Father, that knowledge goes nowhere if we don't put it into action and faith. And I pray that what we're learning here, Father, although it may seem remote, it may seem removed from our everyday life, there's certainly something, Father, that you would have us know that changes who we are and how we live. Let each of us, Father, search our hearts by the Spirit to know what that is, to not be content to simply hear but be intent on doing. We seek that desire to to serve you, Father. Show us how to do it better. And we certainly pray, Father, to continue. Let us come back next week and in the weeks to come. Help perhaps to bring a few others, if you may, and uh, let them study with us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.